We want to welcome all of our campuses in today to our first week in Allstruck. And let me just tell you, I'm at the Salem campus, but I am awestruck right now. We have just had an amazing time worshiping the Lord together, haven't we? My gosh, isn't he good? You know the best part? I get to preach from Psalms 2 about Jesus today. My goodness, if you have your scriptures, copy of your scriptures at each of our campuses, go ahead and turn those to Psalms chapter 2. I pray at North Campus, at Southwest Campus, you have had the best time worshiping King Jesus today, that you are awestruck at who he is. I mean, he's powerful. He's so powerful. And we get to see that today. I love Churchwide Series because not only do we get to, to walk through uh, several different chapters and several different um, versions of Psalms in, in, our, in our life groups, meaning six of them, but we're, or five of them, we get to actually do this as well in our worship services. And so today in life group, or this week in life group, you guys will be studying Psalm chapter 1. And uh, you can get some of these books, uh, and it's not too late to get in one of our new life groups or one of our existing life groups. This is all struck. We have them at all the campuses, $3. Absolutely love to get you involved in that. But we're going to be doing that on Sunday morning as well. And so we're going to be looking at Psalm chapter 2 today. Man, I, uh, I love being a dad. I do. Uh, I, I was cut out for it. Love, absolutely. I'm just a big kid at heart, too. And so my kids, I love, um, you know, hanging out, running around with them. But I love that they play sports, and I've coached my kids a couple of times. Man, I can get them up to like, I don't know, five-year-olds, and I'm good. Um, then I hand them off to the professionals. But my kids have, um, have started swimming. They've been, they've been swimming for four years now, and um, they, they love swimming. And I'm kind of a swim dad, like it myself, and uh, not the actual swimming part of it, but the, the just kind of being the dad and, like, you know, bringing the chairs around and holding the towel. That's me. And uh, my son, who's eight, he was in uh, seven and eight-year-olds. Now, here it is. Last year, he was a seven-year-old living in an eight-year-old world, you know? So it's like he was going up against the eight-year-olds, but this year, he's eight. You know what that means? The spirit of Michael Phelps is upon him, right? <laughs> and so this year, going into swim, we were like, man, it's on. Like Donkey Kong, it is. We are going to do it. We went to our first uh, meet, and he was ready. I mean, we were pumped, and uh, he got up on the blocks. So you have these blocks you dive off of, diving blocks. And so he's up there. He's all ready, man. He's ready to go. And so here's how they start. They go, take your marks, swimmers. You know, swimmers, take your marks. And then uh, uh, it sounds more like this. I mean, that's kind of how it sounds. You don't really know what they're saying. And all of a sudden, they either, like, blast like a gun or they, they like, do this, like, really wild uh, horn, and then you jump. Well, when Parker was up there, you know, there's about 100 adults in, in the room, really kind of closed quarters in this thing. He did a false start. First meet, first swim, my boy, bloop, right there in the drink. And exactly, because what? Eight-year-old falls in the pool, what do you do? You laugh at him. Horrible people you all, my goodness. Well, anyway, listen, for an eight-year-old, because oh, I was kind of laughing too. Uh, uh, for an eight-year-old man, that is horrible. It paralyzed him. My boy's in the drink, and he, he's not getting out. I'm like, okay. You know, I'm the dad that claps. All right, you got it again. Let's go. He ain't getting up. Coach comes over. He ain't getting up. Referees, he's not getting up. So here I go. I, I do the walk, you know. Go over there. Hey, man, he is not talking to me. He will not talk to me. Finally, get him out, you know, because I can still pick him up when he's eight out of the pool, right? And so I get him, and man, we're doing this long shot, and his head is down. He's got his head down. He's got his towels over, over his head. Take him out into the hall, man, and he, he loses it. I mean, he just loses it. He's just like, Dad, I'm embarrassed, and I'm never going to swim again. And, you know, I just I felt for him. You know, there's a part of me as a dad, praise God for Jesus and the Holy Spirit, because there are just points where I've just been a dad, and I've been just like, Hey, you know what? Get out there. Put that swim cap on tighter, man. You'll be all right. Rub some dirt on it, even though you don't have dirt in the pool. And just get out there and do it again. But, man, I, I you know, the spirit was, was definitely stronger than the flesh at this point. And I bent down with him. And, you know, I asked him a question. Questions are really important in our lives. You need to learn to ask good questions. I'm learning to ask good questions. And I said, <clears throat> Parker, what's really wrong? 
to where finally he calmed down, could look me in the eye, and we began to have a talk. Questions do that. Questions have a way of taking the emotions inside of us and the circumstances and everything that we experience, and they kind of level them out. And this is what happens in Psalm chapter 2. So if you have your Bibles, we're going to turn to Psalm chapter 2, and we're going to look as it begins with a question. Now, I'll give you a little background on the Psalms, the book of Psalms. is uh, 150 chapters. Uh, the range of emotions that you feel when you read the Psalms, are cra- there's Psalms like this. Praise the Lord in the heights. Praise the Lord in the depths. Praise the Lord with everything. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. And you're just like praising the Lord. And then there's, there's Psalms like this. My enemies hate you and I hate you with a hatred that's never been hated and I want to hate you more. I mean, that's literally, when you read the Psalms, you're kind of in between those, and it's because we're emotional creatures, and emotional creatures have, 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 have written these, and, and it's really, you feel the heights and depths of the, the, the experience of a human as you read the Psalms, and so you will see that as we go through these, these Psalms. Um, there are all kinds of different genres of the Psalms. There's lamenting Psalms, where Israel and the people of God are just lamenting the conditions of the world. There are songs of praise. This is what we call a coronation song. It's coronating a new king, in a sense. Uh, there are all types of psalms, and we'll see all these. And, and mostly, um, the psalms, as we look at them, this one starts with a question. And if you have your, your, uh, your copy of the notes, and also, if you have your Bible, we can look at this, and we'll walk through this text together. Psalms 2. Verse 1, why do the nations rage? Why do they? I mean, think about it. Why do they rage? They've been raging for a long time. I mean, why do people rage against one another? Why, why can't we all just get along in a sense? Why is it from the very beginning that we've really struggled with one another, not only horizontally, with families, not only with nation against nations, but, but also against God our Creator. Why is it that we struggle so much? You would think with all the technology, with all the education that we have, that we're not living in some kind of dark ages anymore. You would think that we could actually learn how to get along. A lot of people say that you can get along better if you're educated, but we've noticed that we can't educate ourselves out of this. Why do the nations rage? If you look at your Apple news feed or any kind of thing that you're following today, you'll see... You know, all kinds of things against nation against nation, family against family, person against person. And it's amazing now, even in the day that we're living, is that not only the nations rage, nations are made up of individuals. Now, a lot of us have voices and we can rage with the best of them. I mean, think about all the things that you rage against. You rage against your favorite team. You rage against your favorite player. You rage against this. You rage against taxes. I mean, you know, there's one thing about raging against the things that are bad in the world, but we'll take that same rage. I will too. And we'll absolutely blast somebody that didn't get our iced tea right, right? Why do the nations rage? Why do they? I mean, this is a penetrating question for it. It's actually more of a penetrating question is why does Kevin Wilson rage today? What is that deep down in that I don't feel the peace that I do, the shalom of God? It says, why do the nations rage? As you you look at this, as you're following along in your notes that you have, uh, in your notes, there's always a place where you can kind of fill them out. Here's what I want you to see in it, is that the first thing I want you to see in in chapter 2, verses 1 through 3 is this, is the vanity of the opposition of sinful men. Here's what the passage is going to say. It's going to keep on. It's going to say, why do the nations rage and the people's plot in vain? Why do we rage so much at one another horizontally on this plane and vertically against God and that this is in vain? This is in vain is what what it's going to say. It's, It's going to continue to say this. It's going to say, the kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord And against his anointed one, saying, and look what they say. They say, let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. Essentially what they're saying to God is as the nations are raging is like this. We don't want your rule in our lives. Snap the cords from us. We don't want that rule in our life. And if we look at it just in ourself, it's really hard sometimes as humans, we do not like to be told what to do. We don't like to be told what to experience. Personal autonomy for several people is incredibly big. It really is. 
And these nations, as they rage, they have an object of their wrath and their rage. And it, who's it against? The Lord and His anointed one. They look at God the Creator and the anointed one that He's given, and they rage. And here it is. Their plot, their raging, the Scriptures are going to say it's vanity. In Ecclesiastes, the preacher who was Solomon in his older age would say, vanity of vanities, all things are vanities. But you know what? Even if something is vain, doesn't mean that you won't attempt it. My kids, many times, I may give them a rule or something, and I would love for them to follow after their father with their own heart. And even though their ways of doing things, they're going to be vain in the end, that doesn't mean that they still don't attempt it. The kings gather together and they attempt. They attempt to do this. Here as we see this, this Psalms chapter 2, I don't know if you're familiar with this psalm. It may not be something like you to Psalms 23 or Psalms 150 or Psalms 100, but this is actually one of the most quoted psalms in the New Testament. The, the, the apostles use it a lot. And so in Acts 4, the apostles, Jesus Christ has resurrected and, and he's ascended into heaven and the church is beginning to, to, to go and to, to pick up speed. And in, in Romans, I mean, excuse me, in Acts chapter 4, they are, they are in Jerusalem and they're giving an account for what has happened with Jesus Christ. And this is what it says. Uh, the, the apostles are talking to the officials and they say, Who through the mouth of our father David, your servant said by his Holy Spirit. And here he goes. He quotes Psalms 2. It says, Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves together and their rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. Let me tell you why they were able just to grab this. You know, they, they didn't have a scroll they could pull out and say, hey, let me look and see what it said in Psalms 2. Actually, the way the Hebrew Psalms would have been put together, you didn't have like Psalms 2, Psalms 1. They were all together and how a young man or a young woman in the Hebrew faith and early Christians would understand what Psalm they were talking about. It was by the first line. So this was, why do the nations rage? That's this Psalm. Psalms 23 would be, the Lord is my shepherd. This is how they would know and they would learn that. Do you know that's why kids' life is so important to us? One of the things we do in kids' life is we do something called the Gospel Project and we're going to see Jesus all the way from Genesis all the way to Revelation and hiding the Word of God in our hearts so that we don't sin against Him and so that we understand Him. That's why it's so important for our kids to know Scripture. Why? So that when they need it, they can pull it out because it's God's own Word. This is why it's so important. And these men were able to pull this scripture out. And look what they do with it in, in Acts 4. They pull this scripture out and they say this. For truly in this city, where are they? They're in Jerusalem in Acts. They were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus. Who's the anointed one in Acts chapter 2? Or excuse me, in Psalms chapter 2? It's Jesus. Whom you anointed both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles and the people of Israel. And so you see in Psalms chapter 2, it's talking about the anointed one and who comes against him. And there are four people it actually mentions here. Herod. Remember Herod? Herod mocked Jesus. Herod wanted to see a sideshow of Jesus. He wanted Jesus to do something for him. Show me a parlor trick, Jesus. Show me a parlor trick. Let's put a purple robe on him and have him come before me. You know, a lot of people, that's what they want to see out of Jesus. Show me a parlor trick. Show me something. Show me something. If you're the king of the Jews, you're almighty, do something. Do something to show me. A lot of us, when we look at the Holy One, we treat him a whole lot like Herod. What about Pontius Pilate? You remember Pontius Pilate? He's mentioned in this list. What did Pontius Pilate do? He could find no fault in Jesus. A lot of people find no fault. They believe he's a good religious teacher. I mean, he had some good things to say, but they wash their hands of him. In a sense, what they're doing is a lot of times we know that there's some kind of sin in our life, but we'll, we'll cover up with the water of our own washing instead of the blood of Jesus. And we'll just have enough religion and enough to wash ourselves away till we walk away feeling pretty good before God. Saying, I really know I, I kind of made the wrong decision, but I've kind of made some resources over here. And a lot of us treat Jesus just like Pontius Pilate. What about the Gentiles? Who were the Gentiles? Whether they were the Romans at that time, the Gentiles in Jerusalem. And they were the ones that crucified Jesus because they saw him as an enemy of the state. And although it was handed down by the proconsul, their Pontius Pilate, actually in history, the Gentiles were the ones who crucified him. They were the one that drove 
the, the stakes in his, in his wrist and also in his feet. They were the ones that hung him. It was the Gentiles. That he was an enemy of the state. And a lot of people see Jesus as the enemy of the kingdom. That everything's going well, but Jesus will turn over all kinds of things in your life. And then finally, the Jewish people. They were religious. They really knew religion really well. I mean, they'd gone to the synagogues a lot. They understood how to tithe, and they understood how to, to do sacrifices. They understood what it meant to go to a synagogue and hear the, 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 the word preached. But yet, when their king came before them, they said, crucify him, crucify him. This is how the nations rage against Jesus. This is how me and you rage against Jesus. Man, I'm like, that. I'm like the Jews. I don't know if you identified with any of these, but I'm a pretty religious dude. I grew up in church. I just did. I learned the rules. I, I learned what it was to, to, to do and how to act and what you should stay away from. But, but, but growing up, no one fueled my love for a king. They fueled my love for right behavior. Because right behavior can be trolled. And it was amazing that sometimes Jesus comes in and he's like a lion and he's a king. He's going to have his throne. But yet we rage at him in such a sense. I rage at him in such a sense. But it doesn't stop there because here in the text, God is actually going to give an answer. And we see this answer beginning in verse uh, 4. It says, he who sits in the heavens laughs. Here's what I want you to see. God's answer from heaven against the sin of men. God just doesn't like overlook stuff, you know? God doesn't overlook things. Like, I have to overlook a lot of stuff just as you interact with people, as, you, as your dad. He overlooked things, some things, and it's good to overlook some stuff, but God over, never overlooks sin. So as the nations are raging against the anointed one, against the Lord, look at the answer of God. The answer of God is here in verse 4. He who sits in the heavens laughs. Why does he laugh at the nations? Because as they're trying to set borders, as they're trying to set kingdoms, as this king is coming and that king is coming, as Pontius Pilate is taking his time on history, as others like Nebuchadnezzar are taking his time in history, he laughs because his throne is never unoccupied. No one is at the gates of heaven setting a besiege on it. He looks at heaven and he laughs from there. He laughs at everything that is happening. It'll go on and it'll say this. The Lord, or excuse me, it goes on. He says he sits in heaven and laughs. The Lord holds him in derision. And then he will speak to them in his wrath. We don't hear a lot about this anymore. He speaks to them in his wrath. Not in his love. We'll get to that. Speaks to him in his wrath. Throughout all the Old Testament, where God would see sin, he would pour out his wrath on him. He would say, there's two ways to go. And if you go this way, it'll go well with you. If you go this way, I'll pour my wrath out on you. Why? Because he judges sin. He judges sin. That is God's job is to judge sin because he's holy and powerful and set apart. And so he judges sin. He says, I will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury. So when God's wrath is meet them, it terrifies these nations. And let me ask you, when was the last time you sat and you heard about the Word of God so much that it terrified you a little bit? It's amazing. We can have our hands, our eyes, our ears, our feet, some of us embedded in sin, and our hearts grown so callous that we can hear about the judgment of God, and it doesn't even get our blood pressure up one little bit. Have we inoculated ourselves so much with the love of God and such that we see it as cheap grace? Dietrich Bonhoeffer said there's no such thing as cheap grace because there's no such thing as cheap sin. There's no such thing as cheap sin. Every bit of sin costs the judgment of God to come down. And this is what it says out of the scriptures. It says, as for me, this is God speaking. I have set my king on Zion and my holy hill. And here's what he says. This is beautiful. He says, as for the way that I'm going to relate to you, I have a king. I don't need your earthly kings, even the best of them. Even the guys who rule for 50 years, I have a king. And I've set him on Zion's hill. I have set this king on Zion's hill. And this king is there for you. This king is my answer for all things. In Revelation 11, 18, again, he uses this verse. He says, the nations raged. Again, going back to that verse. But your wrath came. And the time for the, judge was, the dead to be judged. And rewarding your servant. 
He sets his king on the holy hill. It says that the all creation is the Lord and his earth is his footstool. On this footstool, he sets this king. In 1 Corinthians 1.20, Paul is going to write this. Who is the one who is wise? Who is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has God not made foolish the wisdom of this world? All the ways that we put things together, God is above all of our ways. And he understands our ways and is acquainted with our ways, but he's above these things. So he sets his king up on the holy hill. You see, when we talk about this king and how we interact with this king, a lot of us will try to hold his hand and yet still hold the world's hand, hold the hand of this king, but yet still hold the ways of the old life and the old life and the old ways and not be refreshed with the new life that this king gives. You know, a, a Christian who engages and makes a practice of sin, it's, it's, a, it's a really hard thing. It's a, it's, it's a terrible thing. Actually, this is what C.H. Spurgeon talked about. Uh, a great quote when he talks about Christians who engage in this rage and this sin against God. He says this, Christians can never sin cheaply. You know, I've believed for a long time I can sin cheaply. It won't cost me much. You know, it won't cost me much. But we can never sin cheaply. He goes on to say this, they pay a heavy price for iniquity. Transgression destroys the peace of mind, obscures fellowship with Jesus, hinders prayers, brings darkness over the soul. Therefore, do not surf, do not be the surf or the bondman of sin. And I think if you're like me, sometimes I get really comfortable with my sin. I get really comfortable with the way that I present myself before God. And I don't give him my best. And I'm definitely not, I haven't done a really accounting of what I've, where I've been, how I've, how I've reacted in this. And sometimes it's because I'm looking for cheap, cheap grace in a sense. But even in my sin, Christ meets me. Watch how this psalm changed. Watch how the gospel overtakes this psalm. Okay? Third thing I want you to see is this, is that the inheritance of Christ is found in his rule of the nations. Now follow me. The nations are raging against God. But watch what happens here as we look at these next verses. Verse 7, it says, I will tell of the de de decree. So here's this fourth telling. There's a de decree that's going out, all right? And this is what the gospel is. The gospel is a decree. It's a decree of the victory of Jesus Christ. That's what the gospel is. It's the good news. It's the good news of this king who has come, who's sitting on Zion Hill. And here he is. I will tell of his decree. The Lord said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will make the head nations your heritage. When we talk about that, that, that word begotten, we'll see it in the King James in John 3.16. For God so loved the world that, his, that he gave his only what? Begotten son. The begotten son of God. It doesn't mean that he created him. It just means that he was begotten, that he was attached to the Trinity. And he gave. He gave the inheritance of the nations, this raging nations, to this king, this great king, this wonderful, peaceful king who comes and walks along beside these nations who are rogue and running all over the place. And he comes along beside them. And you see this in this passage. It says, the Lord has said to me, you are my son. Today I've begotten you. Verse 8, ask of me and I will make the nations your heritage. We do not go because it's a good thing to do. We do not go on mission trips. We do not get K-cups or we do not supply shoes because it's a humanitarian effort. The gospel is behind it. The gospel is the engine behind every mission endeavor we do. For those nations are raging, and there is a king who has come. If you've never been out of the country in another nation, and you see all kinds of nations who worship all kinds of God made of wood and hay and stubble, and here in America, we do the same thing. We have American gods in a sense, whatever they are, and we are absolutely bound to those gods. And here comes the great God, the anointed God, the God Jesus Christ. And I don't even know how he does it, but by 
always Holy Spirit. I have been in nations before and I've seen men who grew up in Hindu or they grew up in Buddha, in Buddhist uh, culture, or they grew up in Muslim faith and God has spoke to them, rescued them out of that because he's making the nations his inheritance. That's why we grasp missions. That's why we go so that the whole world can know this great king is there. It's just not something we do. It's something that we are. Because he makes the nations his heritage. Doesn't this sound like the Great Commission? Oh, it does. Listen, the Great Commission, he says, all authority has been given unto me. That therefore go, baptize, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, to every tribe, to every nation, to every tongue. It has its foundation in the, in the very central gospel. It's a proclamation of the gospel. We must be global. This is what John Stott says. We must be global Christians with a global vision because our God is a global God. He loves the nations. Therefore, you should love the nations. Can I say something? You should love the nations here in Roanoke Valley. You should love them. You should... The, the, we are not a raging, vengeful people. We're a people of peace. Because God has ushered his peace into our lives. How can we not be peacemakers all over the place? I tell you, the gospel breaks down every barrier, even if it's a racial barrier. He can break it down today. I grew up in a home, in a home that I absolutely love. But there were barriers there that the gospel wanted to break down and our hearts need to be broken by those things. There is absolutely no barrier you should have in a horizontal way with the children of God today because the nations are his inheritance. But it doesn't stop there. The gospel doesn't stop. It keeps going. It says this. It says in verse 8, until the ends of the earth is your possession. All right? So where the sun sets, that's what Jesus owns. All right? That's what Jesus owns. And it says, you shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. What does this mean? As a shepherd, the way a, a shepherd, this rod that they talk about, it says, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me, Psalms 23. This rod is a shepherd's rod. It'd have a crook on one end. But one of the things a shepherd would use, the, the rod at the bottom of it, is he would separate the sheep from other animals. That's what he would do. And Jesus talks about this as he shepherd, separates the sheep from the goats. Or the sheep and from, from the goats. And this is what separates people. Listen, religion is not what separates you from the fury and the wrath of God. Nor church attendance. No growing up in America. It is simply the blood of the lamb. The shepherd, the great shepherd has come upon you. And has made you a sheep and called you into his own fold. This is what Jesus was talking about. You see, it, it, it takes another turn here in verse 10. And here's the last thing I want you to see. Is that God's invitation is to everyone. Verse 10, it says this. Now therefore, O kings, be wise. What are these kings doing in, in the first couple of verses? They're fighting. They're warring against each other trying to find political dominance or to extend their territory or whatever it is that nations try to do in a sense. What does he say? Be wise. In your own kingdom today, whatever you're trying to establish, look up here for a minute. Be wise. Listen well. Okay, listen well. I'm speaking to my own self. God does not issue an ultimatum. He issues an invitation. Some of you grew up, and the way that you see God is kind of like I did when I was, as I grew up, is you see him laying down a lot of ultimatums. Do this or this. Do this or this is going to happen. And yes, certain, there are certain commands in the scriptures. You cannot deny them, but that's how you see God. Keep your nose clean or this is going to happen. And you live like that in a way. And what would happen is if God walked into the room, you would get everything all straight, right? <laughs> But then the moment you feel like God's back this turn, what? You, 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 dip your, you dip your hands right into the sin again. And man, that's, that's bondage. Listen to me. That's bondage. That is not freedom. That is not what God has called us to. It's because you think that God has given this ultimatum. He extends an invitation. 
Watch it. This is awesome. All right? So watch. Be wise. Be warned, O rulers of the earth. So God gives out warnings, okay? Because he's a great and he's a gracious God. Serve the Lord with fear. Remember how he spoke to him, his wrath is coming, and it terrifies you now. He says, serve me with fear. Come into my house. Serve me with fear and rejoice with trembling. My character has not changed. I'm still pretty scary because I'm the God of the universe. Serve me with fear. Come before me with trembling. And then verse 12 is really, really hard to translate. It says, kiss the sun, okay? And that doesn't mean... Like, like the, the sun there is the word bar in, in Hebrew, and it's more like this. Greet the sun sincerely, and this is this invitation. Because Jesus speaks to cold, dead hearts and says, I want a sincere relationship with you. Not an ultimatum, but an invitation to come to my table. An invitation to come out of the pig pen. An invitation to the prodigal to come home. An invitation for those who are in sin to come and to be rescued. An invitation to the poor to come. An invitation to the needy to come. The invitation to the orphan to come and find a home. An invitation to the nations that were scattered among, that served other the broad gods to come. An invitation from God's own heavenly to come and to be, to get rid of our sin and to come and to be with the one who is here. It says, lest he be angry and you perish in the way, for his wrath is quickly kindled. There will be a day where his wrath is quickly kindled. He will judge the nations. But listen to this last piece of the gospel here. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. God has no tolerance for sin. His wrath is quickly kindled. I love what Derek Kidner said. He says, and there is no refuge from him only in him. There is refuge for your soul in Jesus Christ today. You don't have to be scared. It's not an ultimatum, it's an invitation. You remember my boy? Bloop! Plumping in lane number one, man. Gonna give up, right? Defeated. Never gonna do swim again, Dad. Man, I'm glad God's tender and kind and compassionate with me. Can see things bigger than I. As a dad, I just said, hey man, we're not going to quit the season. And we just kept practicing, right? Repetition. He had to do three more meets to qualify for something that we called champs. Now champs was last week. It was at the YMCA in Salem and I took my place at the same place I take it all the time with my towel draped around me at the end of the lane to where either Anna Kate or Parker can see me when they go. He got up there, man. Same position, right? Now there's like 200 people watching him. And you know what? You'd be a little nervous too if you were in skin-tight drawers with his shirts off, right? I would be too. It's a little intimidating, okay? He takes his goggles. He looks eight years old, man. He's going to go to nine years. This is it. And the gun, boom. And he hits it. Belly flop, boom. And listen, I got a preacher's voice. I'm glad God gave me a preacher's voice. And I summoned every bit I had. I'm like, go, Parker. Because I'm going to out scream all y'all over there, all right? And he's digging, he's digging, he's digging, he's digging. And 45 kids. This is, this is the event where he fell flat on his face. This is the event that he fell flat on his face just three months ago. Down in the water. I'm never going to swim again. This is him after the race. Now listen, you think, if you think I'm going to turn this and say, oh man, if you're hurt today, you just need to keep on going. Uh-uh. No. A lot of people see Jesus like they see my son that first race. He's crucified. That all his followers left him. How would a God man come here and jump off the starting blocks three years of ministry and be crucified? That may be the world's picture of Jesus. That ain't the Father's picture of Jesus. Let me tell you the Father's picture of Jesus. You may tell you the church's picture of Jesus. I'll tell you who he is. He's not a God amongst gods. 
He is the God. He is not a king amongst kings. He is the king. He is not just someone who came another message or another philosophy, something that we can tap and strap the American dream on. It says this about him in Philippians, that he came and he humbled himself and he gave him over to death, even a death of the cross. And because of that, God the Father has absolutely made him preeminent among all things, that in the name of Jesus, that everyone will bow, whether they are in heaven, they are on earth, or they are under earth, and they will claim the name of Jesus Christ because he is the king. Number one, give him the crown, give him the glory, give him everything. He is eternity. He is the one. Don't rage against him anymore. He's your father. He is your savior. He is your Messiah. There is no refuge from him but there is refuge in him today that is our king that is our king so crown him the Lord of glory today maybe you're a Herod and you're trying to see a sideshow spectacle come intimately to the son he doesn't need to perform for you he's the king Throw off your religion today. It will not save you. It will not save you. Only Jesus will. And he needs to break the pride of men in our hearts today. He is the only one who can save you. Give up your kingdom today. He's the one that can save. He's the one that can save. Father, help us today, Lord, to sincerely embrace the Son in all of his glory, in all of his strength, in all of his power.